All right, everybody. Um, we are ready to start talking about Chapter 20, which is um, all about gene populations, variation, and we will, of course, talk about uh, some evolution in here. First thing you need to know is what genetic variation is. Uh, different alleles of genes found within individuals of a population. So, <clears throat> in other words, the more genetic variation there is in a population, the healthier that population is. So, if you take a look at, you know, humans, to even just take a look at the people around uh, that you're sitting around right now, if you're sitting around anybody, and um, there's lots of different variation within humans. You know, yes, we all have two eyes. Um, a nose and a mouth and, you know, two arms, two legs. But, you know, we all have a different heights. We all have different hair color. Even if we say we have brown hair color, we have different browns. And, and so genetic variation is um, really important to the health of any kind of a species. And, <clears throat> of course, Darwin was the, the one that we associate with um, all of this genetic variation and knowing how it is passed on from generation to generation. And, and we associate him with uh, talking about evolution. And his idea of evolution is what we refer to as descent with modification, which literally just means that species change over time. So this generation is a little bit different. It has some modifications that the last generation didn't, and our next generation will have a little bit of changes um, that our generation didn't, and so on and so forth. And so that's called descent with modification. And over uh, a long period of time, this is how new species arise. And all species, those new species then, all share a common ancestor. So if you take a look at dogs, for instance, and we'll talk about dogs a little bit later in this presentation, uh, and you look back at their ancestry, you can trace all dogs back to wolves. All, all the dogs that we have today, yes, even your fluffy little cockapoo um, originated with uh, the genes from wolves. And so species uh, will share a common ancestor with all of these changes over time or descent with modification. Of course, um, Darwin, we also associate with the term natural selection, which we call um, survival of the fittest. Remember back in honors biology, I always said those two terms are interchangeable. <clears throat> and what does that mean, survival of the fittest? Well, um, individuals who are best fitted to the environment will be able to survive and then pass those genes on to the next generation. So what traits are advantageous? It depends on where you are. Polar bears, it's advantageous to have white fur. They blend in. You can Their offspring then, if they have white fur, will pass those genes on to the next generation, so on and so forth. But polar bear gives rise to an offspring that has purple fur. Well, that's going to show up, of course, um, in the snow, and that's not going to be advantageous. And those individuals that have more advantageous traits usually end up having uh, more offspring than those with the less advantageous traits. And so um, those genes kind of uh, whittle themselves out of the gene pool after a while. And so eventually populations will include more and more individuals with um, the advantageous trait to make the whole species more fit to the environment. And I don't know if you remember or not, but <clears throat> we talked about, in honors biology, we used giraffes to talk about this whole idea of, um, you know, how do species change over time. And, and uh, you know, Darwin, of course, said that, well, or there'd be variation amongst all the length of the necks of giraffes. And so there were some giraffes with longer necks than others, and those giraffes with longer necks were able to reach the leaves up in the tall parts of the tree and those with the shorter necks weren't and so um, those that could reach the leaves could eat, they'd survive and they'd pass their genes on to the next generation and those that were too short to reach the leaves, well they would die and I usually pulled up somebody who was way taller than me in class and I would joke about how they were, weren't were going to share their leaves and they would survive and I would uh, not be able to survive. And then I don't know if you remember the opposite of that, though. That was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and he's the one that said, oh, no, 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 we can change our characteristics, and then we'll pass those on to, to the next generation. So 
in his idea of, uh, of how giraffes got their long necks, he said that, well, giraffes just stretched their necks so that they could reach the leaves on the tree. Well, if that was the case, I wouldn't have to keep asking tall people to reach things for me. We, we know that this doesn't make any sense. You know, if, for instance, if you have a tattoo, Lamarck would say that, well, then your offspring are going to have a tattoo. Well, we, we know today that that is, is not it. So um, it was after that that everybody realized that uh, Darwin was right, and, and certain traits are passed on from generation to generation. And if you look around in nature, you'll see all of these different variations and what makes different species more um, uh, viable than others. Um, something you probably don't realize, uh, you know, we talk about blood types, we talk about blood type A, B, O, and AB. And uh, we also talk about sometimes about this thing called RH factor, negative and positive. But there are actually uh, over 45 genes in your uh, makeup that code for things in your blood type besides just the A, B, and the O um, blood groups. So there, there's a lot of variation just amongst humans and their blood types. And how do you get that many different variations, 30, literally 30 different blood groups um, when you put everything together. Well, it's called enzyme polymorphism. Um, what that means is that at one particular area, which we call a locus on a DNA molecule, there can actually be more than just one set of genes. Easy way to think about that, a locus, it's just an area on a chromosome. You know, we've talked about gene color, or excuse me, eye color before and hair color before, and we've always talked about how there's a dominant trait and a recessive trait. And, you know, we have blue eyes, we have brown eyes, we have green eyes, we have kind of grayish eyes. Well, if there truly were just one set of genes here, why wouldn't all of us with brown eyes have the same color brown eyes? Start looking around at people's eyes. They don't. Like my brown eyes have green flecks in them. Other people's brown eyes are really, really brown. Blue eyes is a really easy one to see the variations in. Some people have that really vibrant blue. Some people are more of a gray blue. Some people are more of a green blue. Well, how can that possibly happen if there's just one set of genes here? Well, it, it can't. This is a polymorphic trait, meaning there's actually a whole bunch of different genes that could be in this area to give humans all of the differences in our, um, in our eye colors. Same thing with hair color, natural hair color, that is, not the, not the helped along by your hairdresser hair color. But think about people with brown hair. Are all the browns the same? Nope. Are all the blondes the same? Nope. Not even all the reds are the same. And that was a mutation that happened about, mm, I forget, about like 5,000 years ago, I think. So it's because there are multiple genes in that area. That's called polymorphism. And uh, that is one of the things that leads to all of these different variations in nature. Um, dogs is a really good example to look at it in. Those of you that have dogs, and maybe you've had like all the same kind of dog. Uh, maybe you've had all labs, or maybe you've had all golden retrievers, or all cocker spaniels. Well, the allele for um, dog color fur, it's, uh, it's called the E locus. It's here. Well, there are lots of different possibilities that you could have here. If you take a look at golden retrievers, you know, we call them golden. And yeah, they are all golden, but are all of their shades of golden the same? Well, they're not. Um, and so uh, it's because of this idea of polymorphism. Um, varying combinations of these alleles give different pigmentation that you can see in dogs. Um, my uh, daughter and son-in-law have a Bernese Mountain Dog, and Bernese Mountain Dogs have, have definite uh, patterns of white, brown, and black on their fur. And if you actually put several Bernese Mountain Dogs together, you would notice that, well, some of them have more brown in this area, some of them have less white in that area. And again, that's what gives them all a lot of variation. That's what makes them different. So uh, a lot of people said, okay, so we know that we've got these genes that are dominant and recessive, and we've got favorable traits, and, and uh, Hardy and Weinberg, these two scientists, they said, well then, okay, if there's definitely traits that are more advantageous than others, 
Why, after several generations, didn't an entire population all have a dominant trait? Why didn't everybody in a population have brown eyes? Why didn't everybody in a population um, have uh, attached earlobes? Things like that. And what they figured out was the original proportions of the genotypes in a population um, will only remain constant if these five things happen. Um, if there are no mutations that take place, then yeah, everybody will have the dominant trait. If no genes are transferred from one source to another, in other words, if no uh, nobody new comes into a population, if you don't have a bunch of people leave a population, everything remains the same, then yeah, and maybe we'll get all the same uh, dominant traits. If random mating is occurring within that, oops, sorry, within that population, um, then the gene populations will remain the same. If a population is very large, those percentages are going to say, stay the same. The same percentage will have brown eyes as will have blue eyes. And if there is no such thing as natural selection, then these um, genotype percentages will remain the same. Well, in the real world, these things don't happen. This would be in a perfect situation. This would lead to everybody having a dominant trait. But we all know that these th that's, that's just not how the real world operates. Now, they did come up with a way to calculate um, genotype frequencies. So, for instance, um, how many of them were homozygous dominant in a trait? How many were homozygous recessive in a trait? How many of them were heterozygous? And this is an equation they came up with. And I will tell you on exam number four, there is a question about this that you're going to have to do. So um, we'll, we will go over one of these examples in class. But in the meantime, um, I need you to uh, understand that. So homozygous for the first allele would be P. Second allele would be Q. Heterozygous is 2PQ. And since there's only two alleles in our examples, P plus Q must equal 1. So what you do is, is you get certain percentages and you plug them into this. And again, like I say, we'll do one in class. Here's an example of uh, phenotypes, black cats and white cats and their genotypes. And what would the frequency be of each of these alleles? Um, just kind of another... Uh, example of how you do that sort of thing. You can do it with a Punnett square. Now, what I do want you to do in the meantime, there's a link to a video, short little video, but really, really uh, easy to understand Hardy-Weinberg video, um, and it deals with these cute little penguins. So before we go over one in class, and I'll do this before exam number four, um, I want you to take a look at this and uh, uh, gather as much information as you can about the Hardy-Weinberg principle before we go over one and before the exam. Okay, so a population not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, which would be pretty much every population in the world be uh, because um, none of us are stagnant, um, it indicates that one or more of five evolutionary agents are operating. These are pictures of what those agents are, but let's just, uh, and you can go back and look at those if you want. So if there's, what this is saying is if there is no mutation, then a population will be in what's referred to as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There's mutations all the time. Um, you have mutations in your body right now and you don't even know it. Most mutations don't turn you into uh, you know, a zombie or make you grow green hair or anything like that. Most of them we don't even notice. Um, one that actually I have seen starting in the last probably 30 years though has to do with wisdom teeth, which is pretty interesting. You know, most of us have, we are born with four wisdom teeth. We've talked about uh, what those wisdom teeth are um, before. And probably 30 years ago, if I would have asked that question of, you know, how many of you have all four wisdom teeth, every hand would have gone up. Where over the last 10 to 15 years, what I've noticed is that there are now people being born with only three of four wisdom teeth, only two of four wisdom teeth. And there are actually people born now without any wisdom teeth at all. Well, a mutation has happened in the human genome so that that gene no longer exists. And so maybe a hundred generations from now, the percent of uh, humans without wisdom teeth will be 50%. And then maybe another hundred generations from then, uh, eventually we'll get 
to the point where 99% of the human population isn't born with those uh, wisdom teeth anymore. So mutations are a big agent of evolution. Now, of course, if mutations didn't happen, everything would stay the same, but mutations happen all the time. Uh, gene flow is another reason that evolution uh, happens in a population. <clears throat> Movement of alleles into and out of uh, populations, immigration, emigration happens. Um, this tends to what we refer to as homogenize allele frequencies, which means mixing uh, two alleles uh, to become more like one allele, um, mixing two flower colors to become more like one color, something like that. Again, a link to a short little video on gene flow. Please watch that. Non-random mating um, will lead to evolution. Um, Non-random mating means mating with specific genotypes. That's definitely going to shift genotype frequencies. And you know, I, I, I hate to mention this, but um, this is kind of what Hitler wanted to do. He wanted, he wanted a whole population of blue-eyed, blonde Germans. And so he was trying to get rid of those of us that have dark eyes and dark hair. Well, that would have definitely changed um, the gene frequencies of, of uh, all those traits if he had actually succeeded in doing that. A sort, there's uh, two different kinds of, of mating. There's assortive mating and then there's disassortive mating. Assortive mating means uh, phenotypically similar individuals mate. So for instance, dog breeding. Okay, Those of us that have purebred dogs, you are taking a golden retriever a female and a golden retriever male. Phenotypically similar individuals and mating them. Um, it's not going to change the gene frequencies. Um, it's actually going to increase the proportion of homozygous individuals. All, you know, if you look at all golden retrievers, they all have characteristics. If you look at all um, basset hounds, they have all those characteristics. Well, that's called assortive mating. You're taking individuals with very similar traits and, and breeding them. Disassortive mating, phenotypically, phenotypically different individuals mate, producing uh, lots more heterozygotes. So if you think of mutts, <laughs> uh, mutts are heterozygotes. You know, they uh, uh, they've got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They are all very phenotypically uh, different. That's referred to as disassortative, disassortative. Sorry, mating. Genetic drift is another uh, thing that can cause evolution to happen. Random fluctuation in allele frequencies over time by chance. So in other words, individuals are lucky they're not just more fit. So let's say that there's a population of birds and a hurricane flies, uh, goes through the island where these birds live and that uh, hurricane is going to unfortunately kill a lot of birds, but there may be a small population of birds that gets caught up in the hurricane and then dumped onto some other island. Well, those birds weren't fit. They were just really, really lucky. Um, and so what they have created now by going to this new island is well, they have a really, really small gene pool. And um, they are now the founders of a population on this new island. It's referred to as the founder effect. Few individuals found a new population. And again, very small allele pool. And there may actually be some genes from the original gene pool that don't even exist there anymore. Um, this happens when seeds grow into a new field. Um, what this creates is something called a bottleneck effect. Drastic reduction in population and gene pool size. Short link to a video here, please watch that, but I'll show you real quickly. If you take a look, if these were the birds on that original island, notice there's red birds, yellow birds, green birds. Hurricane happens, and these few birds survive, and they're dropped off at a new island. Well, notice we don't have any red birds anymore. All we have are yellow birds and green birds, and so our new population has completely changed the uh, gene pool size and makeup of that species. That causes evolution. Selection can cause evolution to, ha to happen. Um, you know, we've talked about natural selection, but there's also something called artificial selection, mm -hmm. where a breeder selects for desired characteristics. I don't know whether you guys know this or not, but all 
dogs started out as being descendants of wolves um, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago when, when uh, humans started to domesticate animals. They took wolves with certain traits that they liked and they would breed those together. So yes, believe it or not, even this chihuahua, you can trace all the way back to it having an ancestor that's a wolf. That one's a little tough to see, I'm sure. Um, mastiffs, you know, they uh, were traits from wolves um, that made them big and strong were um, taken for the whatever uh, the humans wanted to use these mastiffs for. St. Bernard's um, specific traits were taken from dogs to breed them into what a St. Bernard is now, and their job originally was to rescue hikers and skiers from avalanches. So they needed to be big, strong, heavy, thick fur, um, able to withstand the cold. Uh, Cocker Spaniels, which is what I have uh, in England, they were originally bred to um, flush out things like, um, oh gosh, ferrets and mink, things like that from underground holes. Uh, my dog to this day, he likes to dig. He likes to flush things out. And, you know, every time he can find a mole, man, he finds a mole and he destroys it. Uh, it's tough to breed out those instincts. So that's artificial selection. That is how we've gotten all these different uh, breeds of dogs and cattle and chickens. If you ever go to the fair and you look at all the different types of chickens, good heavens, there's a ton of them. That's all because people picked and choose, picked, they wanted to pick and choose what characteristics they wanted. Natural selection, obviously, a little different. Um, the environment picks which uh, traits are advantageous and which are not. Uh, obviously, over here in this picture is a very hungry bird, and we've got insects that are yellow, and we've got insects that are green on this green leaf. Well, of course, the bird's going to pick the yellow insects because they show up more. So being green is advantageous. Being yellow is definitely not. So in order for natural selection to occur, these um, three things have to happen. There has to be variation amongst population like this, yellow and green. Um, individuals must result in differences in the number of offspring surviving. So, oops, sorry about that. So obviously these poor yellow guys, they're not going to survive and pass on any offspring, but the green guys will. And then this variation must be genetically inherited. It didn't happen because they're sunburned or something. It obviously happened because of uh, their genes. Um, another example um, that you can read here of uh, selection, it's uh, pocket mice from Tellerosa Basin. Again, dark mice, light mice. Um, you can read that for yourselves. Sometimes selection occurs because of a climate. So, um, for instance, within certain latitudes, um, there is a species of fish who uh, do well at, they can survive at, at several different latitudes, but uh, they do much better at one than another. There's an enzyme called lactate uh, dehydrogenase in this weird little fish called a mamachog fish. And what this enzyme does is it uh, converts pyruvate into lactic acid when oxygen is absent. So these fish can survive in polluted waters is basically what, what the premise here is. So in other words, in polluted waters, there's not a whole lot of oxygen. And polluted waters will kill most fish. Well, these guys, because they've got this specific enzyme and they can literally produce uh, ATP by converting uh, glucose into lactic acid. Uh, they can actually survive where other fish cannot. And so these are in some of the um, lower temperatures, the colder temperatures. And so these fish will survive when others don't. Just another type of selection. How do we measure fitness? Well, uh, we measure fitness. Um, there's a mathematical formula for it. The good news is you won't have to do it. But anything that is most fit is given a value of one. Um, but what are the characteristics of something, of a trait that it makes something more fit? Survival is one of them. How long does an organism live? How often does it mate? And how many of those offspring from that mating? survive. 
Um, and these are just some characteristics that you can uh, you can look at that determines fitness. So how frequently or infrequently a phenotype occurs in a population um, shows us how fit an environment is. And there's actually what we refer to as negative frequency dependent selection and positive frequently dependent selection. So there are some traits that, in, that organisms exhibit that everybody in the population, or at least most of the people in the population, actually have the recessive trait. That's negative frequency dependent selection. So for instance, in humans, we, everybody I know has five fingers on each hand, four fingers and a thumb on each hand. But believe it or not, that's the recessive trait. In humans, having six fingers is the dominant trait. Now, for whatever reason, five fingers was selected for in nature. And so we call that a negative frequency dependent selection. Positive frequency dependent selection are most of the other uh, common phenotypes that everybody has. It, for instance, the uh, length of giraffe neck would be a positive frequency dependent selection because A, longer neck is the dominant trait, and B, most of the population has it. So we kind of measure the frequencies of um, alleles in these two different ways. Um, just a couple of pictures and a couple of graphs there to show you that. So there's something referred to as oscillating selection that can happen within species as well. So think about um, think about uh, animals like birds and uh, fish. A lot of times too, there are seasons that are you know they'll have a they'll have a drought one year and then the next year they'll have um, very very wet conditions. Well. For birds, if there's a drought, there are only certain or certain plants that are going to produce seeds, and those seeds probably have a very specific shape. Well, if birds don't have the right beak shape, they're not going to survive that year. Flip-flop to the next year where it is very wet, that means most of the plants are going to produce seeds, and then there's going to be a lot of variation of seeds, so more of the birds with different beaks will survive. So if you take a look at populations of finches in the Galapagos Islands, there are some years where population of, let's say this guy, is very, very high. And maybe the next uh, season it's, uh, it's a drought. Well, that population of those guys will be very, very low. So the numbers oscillate or they change. And usually it's environmental changes that lead to those different types of selection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in any kind of a species, heterozygotes usually exhibit greater fitness than homozygotes. And remember, heterozygous, one dominant, one recessive. Homozygous, either two dominant or two recessive. And a really easy example to understand of that is sickle cell anemia. And we've talked about that before. Remember, all uh, most blood, rat, red blood cells are round. Um, there are some that are sickle shaped, look like a crescent moon, just like this. And um, the purpose of red blood cells is to carry oxygen. Well, individuals in parts of Africa, um, uh, this is where the disease originated. And if they are homozygous recessive, um, that means that all of their cells are sickle shaped. Now, can those cells still carry oxygen? Yeah, not very much, but they can. Um, and they become very anemic, meaning that their their cells aren't carrying enough oxygen. And they're very weak, lethargic, and they don't have a very long lifespan. Well, that's a homozygous type that is, um, that is not advantageous. Uh, homozygous dominant, where they would have all round red blood cells in this part of the world, you would think that would be a good thing. In this part of the world, it's not because people in this part of the world with all round red blood cells are very susceptible to malaria. Remember, malaria is uh, it's, uh, caused by a protist carried by mosquitoes. So here's an example where both homozygous phenotypes uh, are not the best suited to the environment. 
if an, a person is heterozygous, one dominant, one recessive gene, usually they've got some round red blood cells and some sickle-shaped cells. Uh, they're not anemic, and they're also very less susceptible to malaria. So most very, very fit individuals in a population are heterozygous. Um, these just kind of show some different types of variation. Um, you'll take see here disruptive selection, directional selection, stabilizing selection. In other words, where are the most fit in all of those? So you can take a look at those as well. Disruptive selection for large and small beaks in black black bellied seed crack shoo, that's hard to say seed cracker finch of West Africa. Meaning, take a look at their beaks. This guy can eat big seeds. This guy can eat little seeds. Um, sorry. That uh, you'll see that depending on what the um, what the environmental situations are for when those seeds are produced, um, if it is a, a, only the plants with large seeds that are um, reproducing at that particular time, these birds are going to survive. If there are plants that only small seeds are being produced, these um, birds are going to survive. It's called disruptive selection. Um, here are uh, Drosophila. These are fruit flies. Um, if you take a look at average tendency to fly towards the light and the number of generations, um, this is decreases as the number of generation goes. And so this is called directional selection, meaning um, there's no straight bell curve for this. They're actually going to be more at one end or the other of a curve. Um, and then stabilizing selection for birth weight in humans. Why are most babies born somewhere between seven and eight pounds? Because that is where most of the babies survive. Um, too small, they won't survive. Um, too big, depending on where you are, uh, in the world, too big of a baby uh, could cause a real delivery problem if you uh, if you're not near a good hospital. So these are all just a different types of variation in populations. And we are done with chapter 20. If you have questions, holla.